You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as uh, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call in show, the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608 501 0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. At this particular time, we don't have any new callers. So let's just kick this thing off once I turn up the volume so everybody can hear it. Ready, set, go. Hey, Ryan. This is Trucker Bob. Hey, Trucker Bob. I'm sitting there uh, at night with the night off. I'm on a bench here in uh, Pennsylvania looking at the stars up in the sky, waiting to pick up and go to Chicago in the morning. Nice. Now, where I'm going to Chicago, picking up a load, is a big bear's hand. He always wears his bear's dark blue t-shirt or sweater with the big bear and the C on it. Every time I go in, I wear my pecker hat. <laughs> he gets mad at me, cusses me out, and tells me to get off his property until I get rid of the hat. <laughs> so I back my truck up, truck and trailer outside the gate, and I take my hat off, and I put my other hat on, which is a captain's hat. I then drive back onto the lot, and he lets me get my truck load. It's a routine we've been doing for years, and it's a lot of fun, but we enjoy playing the game. Anyways, I want to talk... I will say, as much... I'm, I'm not a truck driver, but as much as I hate backing up um, stuff like that, I, I would give up on that routine pretty quick. Or or just tell them, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not going out and then having to back back in here again, whether it be a boat or... When I did landscaping, you had the 18-foot trailers or whatever. But, um, yeah, I, that's not fun for me, man. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that for giggles. About, are the Packers lucky about having good quarterbacks back-to-back like Favre and Rodgers? Or are the Packers actually really good at getting quarterbacks? I'd like to look over the quarterbacks Green Bay has gotten since the 80s. And some of these guys are pretty good. I think you'll be surprised at how well Green Bay dressed quarterback. The first one I'd like to talk about is Lynn Dickey. He was, he's one on my list that they didn't actually uh, draft, but he made the Green Bay Hall of Fame. He played for 10 years at Green Bay. And uh, he took Packers to the playoffs in 1982. In 1983, he led the league in touchdowns and in passing yards. And he set many Packer records that weren't broken until Aaron Rodgers came along. Injuries kind of cut short his career, and we always wonder how good he could have been if the Packers had a very good defense to go with him. The next quarterback was a 10th round draft pick in 1989. His name was Don Mikowski, the Magic Man. In 1989, he was second team All Pro, uh, second to Montana. And he was also a pro bowler. He was an NFL passing leader, but uh, injuries cut short his career. And if he had stayed healthy, we probably never would have gone out and gotten Favre. 
The next quarterback is ninth round draft pick for 1992, Ty Detmer. He was just a backup uh, to Favre, but in 1996, he took the Eagles to the playoffs as a starter his one good year. I will continue this discussion with another phone call. All right, let's get to it then. <laughs> I hope to finish this up. This is Trucker Bob in the next three minutes. In 1994, the fifth-round draft choice was Mark Brunel. Now, he was really good. He was a three-time pro bowler, 97, 98, 2000. He was an NFL passing yards leader in 1996. He led Jacksonville to the playoffs four of their first five years. Two AFC championship games, they lost both of them. But he did make the Super Bowl as a backup with the New Orleans Saints. The next one was Kurt Warner back in 1994. He was an undrafted free agent. In fact, he didn't even make the team. However, he was a two-time MVP, one-time Super Bowl MVP, NFL Man of the Year, two times All-Pro, four times Pro Bowl, two times NFL TD leader, three times completion percentage leader, one time NFL passing leader, three times he took his teams to the Super Bowl, two different teams, three times, three years in a row, he put up 500 point seasons. He was at the 1994 Green Bay training camp, which I consider the greatest group of quarterbacks in NFL history. You had Favre, who was 1-1 one one in Super Bowls, Warner, who was 1-2 and two in Super Bowls, Detmer, who didn't go, and then Brunel, who was 0-1 uh, who was on one in uh, Super Bowls. So that group of quarterbacks were 2-4 in Super Bowls. Then uh, a couple years later, we drafted a guy named Matt Flynn, as a seventh round draft choice. He did go to one Super Bowl as a starter, working for uh as a backup. He lost, he couldn't get a starting job because he was back up to Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, and Tom Brady. Next quarterback is Matt Hasselback. He was a sixth round draft choice in nineteen ninety eight. He took to Seattle to six playoff appearances, three time Pro Bowl, one time Super Bowl and uh, they lost that Super Bowl, but he made it. So the conclusion is the Green Bay Packers are very good at judging quarterback talent. Bears, Lions, Vikings, well, the Vikings had some good ones, could have had any of these quarterbacks, including Rodgers and Favre, with the exception of just a couple of quarterbacks over the years. These were all better. Every one of these could have played with the Bears or Lions. Taking a look at their total stats, these quarterbacks participated in nine Super Bowls. As starters, they were three and four, and as backups, they were one and one. Favre, Warner, Rogers, Rennell, Flynn, Hasselbeck. Green Bay knows how to draft quarterbacks. Um, I see you called in one more time. But I'm just going to go ahead and give my thoughts just in case because I'm not sure if that's a new thought or if you're going to elaborate. But I think my only issue with that generally, because there certainly has been a great track record in Green Bay, number one would be we're, we're talking about different human beings, right? The people that made the decision to bring in Favre are not the same people that brought in Rodgers are not the same people that brought in Love. And you could say, well, there's one playbook, and that's true, but I don't think Green Bay harnesses any secrets that haven't gotten out. There's so much turnover, right, with with personnel people that everything the Packers know has made it to pretty much every other team in the NFL. Um, now, that doesn't mean people listen. For example, the Green Bay Packers drafted Jordan Love, traded up in the first round while you had Rodgers still sitting there. Most teams wouldn't have done that. Most fans didn't want them to do that. The Packers did it because they prioritize quarterback above everything and by a lot. They're willing to do things at that position that a lot of other people are not. But aside from that, and, and the other thing would be in terms of the GMs and the people that are, that are uh, picking these guys, the Packers get first pick, right? So, for example, Elliot Wolf went elsewhere. He went elsewhere because we allowed him to go elsewhere because we handpicked Brian Gutekunst. 
Right, so the Packers get first pick of the litter, and they're going to find the guy that they think is is the best at finding the the future talent, specifically quarterback talent, and everybody else gets to go away. So while the secrets got out when Elliott and all these other guys left, you still have to execute, and at least according to the people that were here, Mark Murphy, Brian Gutekunst is the guy that's the best at finding that future talent. So, So that might be a slight edge there, but that's kind of as far as I can go with that in terms of assuming that the Packers are going to be better at drafting quarterback talent in the future compared to anybody else. Because I I don't think, I can't imagine that there's too much in the process that the Packers have or that they do in terms of their evaluation specifically of quarterbacks that other teams don't know. Like there's no hidden secret that gets passed down only to the GM. It'd be super dope if there was, you know, like, you know, the, the, only, only the GM can see it, and you can't show anybody else. And until we promote the next GM, you can't you can't view it, right? Now, when you talk about a specific GM, is it possible that that this person or, the, or this unit does a better job with certain positions? Right? Yeah. I mean, we we see patterns, and some of the patterns, granted, granted, do seem to carry over, right? The the lack of third round talent, the uh, offensive line. You know, the fact that we find offensive line or second round wide receivers or whatever, that does seem to carry over at least over the last two GMs. But it's just it's just tough when we're going back to the eighties and trying to figure out what it could be that the Packers have by way of secret knowledge that wouldn't have leaked out to the rest of the NFL by now. Or even process for that matter. I mean, it, it, there's nothing more valuable than finding that quarterback. So if if the Packers have some way of doing it, everybody's gonna want to be figuring out what that is. So I, I clearly there's no debate they've done a great job with quarterbacks, but it's a little bit harder for me to turn that corner to, you know, therefore in the future the Packers are going to do a fantastic job finding quarterbacks from here on out. Sorry, Ryan, that I had to call back one last time. I just wanted to get this last sentence in. Sure. What are the chances of the Green Bay with Love being a good quarterback? If you go by their history over the last 40 years, Love has a very good chance of being a good quarterback because the Packers are very good at drafting good quarterbacks. That is my point. Go Pack Go. Go Love Go. Thank you, Ryan. Sorry it took so long. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's my personal hang-up, I guess, is just because I, I can't logically get there. Um. The pattern is there. The consistency throughout the franchise is there, and 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 again, I can I can get a couple of points. You know the the importance of it, the priority of it. Um, but at the end of the day, there are no certainties, and um, I I can't fully get to the point where I think it's a it's a good chance. Even even if we acknowledge that they are better at drafting quarterback, even still, I don't know that you have a ever have a good chance when you draft a quarterback or anybody for that matter that they're going to be good. But um, you know. There's a lot of reason for optimism. First round pick, uber talented, lots of time sitting. And one of my favorite things that, aside from myself, I don't think I've heard anybody talk about is when you look at draft classes and how important that is, a lot of horrific quarterback draft classes lately. But the one that stands out is that guy, is is the 2021 that Jordan Love was in. And he's the only one that's still a question mark. Everybody else has panned out. And in a major way. Like, the top quarterbacks in the NFL are from that draft class. Herbert and Burrow and Jalen Hurts. I mean, that certainly three top ten, borderline three top five quarterbacks just from that draft class. Oh, and Tua. I forgot Tua. Tua's legitimately up there as well. Packers have done that a lot, and they've had a lot of success with it. You know, we drafted Rashawn Gary in a very heavy edge class that was Bosa and Burns and et cetera, et cetera. And Rashawn has panned out splendidly. Even 2018, Jair, you had Denzel Ward taken at pick four. So I don't know about mega loaded, but it was a pretty solid group of corners. Josh Jackson fell into the second, but he was supposed to be a first round pick, Mike Hughes. But the answer to that question will be um, hopefully just around the corner. Hey, Ryan. What up? Yeah, so today is the 20th, tomorrow's the 21st. The rookies report to training camp tomorrow, and then a few days later, I think 25th, when the veterans report. 
Uh, we're going into this season, a lot of unknowns, and I'm just very thankful for how everything has transpired. Yes, there's mistakes. Yes, there's things that we hit on now that are pleasant surprises, but all in all, Gudikin, Matt LaFleur, everybody, just everything that's happened to this point has all been worth it, I think, and I'm very excited for the future. I think the whole Jordan Love pick and everything, whether it's a hit or a flop, it shows a level of planning and a level of commitment to doing things the right way, and I'm all for it, and whether he's MVP or he's out the league in a year or two, I'm all for Jordan Love, and I'm excited to see what this this young man has to offer us up on this field, and hopefully uh, he can meet the expectations I have of him, because the Chiefs game, I see a lot of good in the Chiefs game that people don't see. The Philly game, I see a lot of the same things I see in the Chiefs, Chiefs game and the Philly game, and I'm all excited. I'm all excited to see the LaFleur un, uh, unedited offense, just where it's all plays built upon each other, and there's a cohesion and everything, so just everybody be excited for the season, it's here almost, and uh, let's see what we got, go back go. Yeah, man, I'm I'm just, I'm, it, it, the closer it gets, the further it feels away, unfortunately, like, <laughs> we're, we're now, uh, what, three days away, and it's like, I just, I, I'm getting angrier and angrier at um, the lack of foot. Or, I'm becoming less patient. Like, I, I need it more and more and more. Um, I think by the time Wednesday rolls around at about 8 o'clock, I'm just going to be twitching somewhere. I'm just going to be losing my mind. But, um, yeah, for, for all intents and purposes, we made it, man. We made it through the dead period. Thank you to everybody that's been riding with me this whole time. Hopefully we get some of the uh, the other uh, estranged Packernet family back. You know, the uh, ones that take the summer off. Understandable, but excited to get everybody back in the fold and start talking about actual things. Actually, it's going to be funny because as soon as it happens, I'm going to spend the whole time going, none of this matters, but... <laughs> You know, well, we won't get any real news until the uh, the pads come on. Then the pads come on. Well, we won't really know anything until the preseason. Then the preseason comes. Well, we don't really know anything until week one. Then week one has, ah, it's just week one. You know, you don't know until, like, you know, mid-season when you get an idea. Then mid-season comes and it's like, well, we got to see what the team is, you know, at the end of the season. That's when you really got to get it in there, you know. No, it matters. It all matters. Not as much as the next thing matters, but it matters. What's going on? It's Almighty Firefighter. How y'all doing? What up? Uh, still, I was just calling, and um, I was listening to how you were talking about when I agree with you, when you uh, when the player leaves, goes to another team, like, that don't make you a fan of that team necessarily, but you might be a fan of that player. Mm-hmm. So I just had a question, and I think it's a good question. I think if you're a football fan, you can at least like and respect other players or other teams, even though you may not cheer for them. So, sticking with the division, give me uh, a couple players in in, the, in our division that you are a fan of, probably in the past. It don't have to be now. Um, that you know that, that's not a Packer. So I'll give you a quick list of mine. So with the Lions, uh, Calvin Johnson and uh, Barry Sanders, I, I yeah, I enjoyed watching them play. And I give them props. Um, Vikings would be Randy Moss yep. and uh, Adrian Peterson. Same thing. I, I, I mean, watch Adrian Peterson run, and then Randy Moss just, even when he crapped on us, I was like, gosh, you know, it was it was still like amazing. Yeah. Um, especially when we did the Cowboys, because I hated the Cowboys <laughs> it was probably a little bit more than the Vikings. <laughs> and he just got them for three touchdowns his rookie year. It was awesome. But anyway. Um, and the hardest one, I'm not gonna lie, is the Bears. Like, I really, like, it's hard for me to be like, oh, the Bears, I like this. And it's, it's, that's the hardest one. But I guess, as far as me, um, watching, probably I'd say Brian Erlacher, probably yeah. my favorite Bear. Um, I can't, I can't. It's, uh, 
play football. So anyway, go back, go. Let me hear your list from everybody. Um, Yeah, so mine is pretty much identical to the ones that you listed. Um, I think the Bears, actually, I have a lot easier time with just because there's so many guys that I respect. Um, Devin Hester, Peanut Tillman, Brian Urlacher, Lance Briggs, Matt Forte. Um, there's a lot of guys that, you know, that you, you just can't help but respect, you know. Um Sure, there's plenty more. Uh, Vikings and Lions are actually a little bit harder for me, but yeah, the, the guys that you listed would probably be almost all that I can think of. I mean, Matt Stafford, um, I mean, he's he's there for a long time. He did some stuff, I guess. Um, but just to switch it up, so I don't have the exact same answers. What about the guys today? I know for the Minnesota Vikings, I would say Harrison Smith. That might be it. Justin Jefferson, I mean, he is, it, it's still, part of the problem is he's so young. I mean, it's one of those things that in, in 10 years we'll be talking about, yeah, Justin Jefferson, massive respect, all that stuff. The The issue that I have is it's it's too recent. <laughs> he hasn't been here long enough, like in the, the, back, the back nine where it's like, yeah, Justin Jefferson. No, he's, he's still young and he's going to torment us for a long time. So I can't, I respect him. I don't like him. But Harrison Smith, for sure. Um, I would say Daniil Hunter, actually. I don't like that he's here, but I would probably add Daniil. Um, probably because he is kind of getting to be that the backside of things, and he's had so many injuries and whatnot, but still got respect for Daniil. Maybe that's it. And Cousins. You got you to gotta throw Cousins in there, man. He, he gets so much hate from his own fan base. I, I've always thought the guy was a good quarterback. I really just genuinely thought he was solid. Detroit and Chicago, I don't know if there are any, to be honest. I'm not going to say Goff. I mean, he in my mind, he's a Ram, and he's still, even though he had a good year last year, I just see him as a, he's a Ram that's not very good. As untrue as that may be, I don't care. Uh, Panay Sewell, again, maybe maybe someday, I don't know. Amon Ra is a someday thing. Aiden Hutchinson hasn't even earned the respect, much less. It's like he's deserving of anything. So yeah, I don't think they have anybody on their entire team that that is really massively deserving of any respect, which is telling. I mean, Amon Ra is great, and, 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 you know, I I shouldn't say not deserving of respect. He's deserving of respect, but not on that tier where I'm going to say he's he's Justin Jefferson, right? He annoys the crap out of me because he's good. But aside from that, it's like, I just, eh. And Chicago's even worse because I don't know if they even have anybody that's deserving of respect. And even the ones that do, they're, they're like guys that they brought, like DJ Moore. First of all, he's not. He's not on that tier. He's never going to be, you know, in the Calvin Johnson, Justin Jefferson conversation ever. Plus, he was brought in. You, you, you didn't draft him. He's not a bear. You just, just like everybody else, you just brought him in because you suck at finding talent, which is the same thing with Chase Claypool and Equinemius and Dante Pettis and everybody else that you keep bringing in year after year after year after year. You brought in Darnell Mooney, whoop de frickin' do, and Valus Jones, who I think is already 42 years old. You brought in Nate Davis. Cody Whitehair had... Like, after his rookie year, I was thinking, this guy's going to be one of the best offensive linemen, and then he just fell off a cliff. Cole Komet's never going to be that guy. Justin Fields has not earned jack squat. None of the running backs. The defense, the only person that that you could even try to convince me on this defense would be Eddie Jackson, and it's not going to happen. The guy's had two good years. One of them was last year. The other was in 2018. There is nobody on this defense that is in any way deserving of any respect. You could say Tremaine Edmonds if you want, because he had that one good year last year, but even that is, again, Buffalo got him. You just brought him in. I'm not giving you credit for that. What, do we get credit for Julius Peppers? Maybe, I don't know. Talk to me when he's Charles Woodson and helps you win a Super Bowl, then we can have this conversation. If he had a so-so career in Buffalo and they let him go, and then you bring him in, and you revive his career, and he is the best in football, and then you go win a Super Bowl on his back, great. Then yeah, sure. Otherwise, there's nothing. Not a single thing. Anyways, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so for as little as $1 per month. Just imagine, man, how much good in the world you could do for just a buck. Also, please remember to check out grassfedcooperative.com. If you're looking for a big old box of meat to get delivered directly to your house, grassfedcooperative.com would be the best place to go find that. 
Remember, you can use code PACKER10, P-A-C-K-E-R-1-0, and you'll get 10% off your order. And considering a big old box of meat isn't going to be cheap, 10% off is actually going to be a pretty big chunk of change. So check them out. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg. This is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. What's going on, Ryan? It's Chris from Alabama. What up? Uh, Calling with another over and under for you. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, This time, talking about Romeo Dobbs. All right, Uh, We got over or under 75 Ah, receptions for the whole season. I'm upset because I just did, for tomorrow's podcast, looking at my expectations for quite a few players, and I did yards. I didn't do receptions. I was ready to have a great answer for you. I'm going with the over. Uh, I know he's been putting in a ton of work, and I think it's going to pay off. And last year he had 42 receptions, I believe, like 425 yards, 420-something yards or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think he'll double that. I think he'll have about 80 to 85. I don't think he reaches the 100. Uh the 100 reception mark, but I do believe that he will double it. So I'm going to stay around, I'm going to say high end 85, uh, which would definitely be over 75. So I'll take the over on that. So just let me know your thoughts and what you think on that. Over or under 75 receptions. All right, go pack, go, and I'll talk to you later. Yeah, so the uh, the tough thing about it is – Trying to figure out what big, how, how big of a role he's going to have. So I, I, again, I kind of go over this tomorrow a little bit. But if you look at it and say, okay, he's the number two receiving option. Last year, the number two receiving option was Rome, uh, was Robert Tunyon, and he ran 370 routes. The problem is that's a really low number. Like we we just had so many guys that really just didn't contribute a ton. If you go based on that and say, okay, he's going to be what Robert Tunyon was and get that many routes and just use the same number of receptions, right? So he had 42 receptions on 312 routes run. If you bump that up to 370, it puts him right at 50 receptions. The problem is if you look at almost any other team where the top two guys getting the receptions are wide receivers, you're going to be in in like the 500 to 600 range. So just for example, Cleveland Browns, Donovan Peoples-Jones was number one with 573 amari cooper was 562 so if you do that then he's at 75 point 
six, so seventy six. So I, I I guess the the unfortunate part about it is if we just keep the receptions about the same per route run, and I know the the thought process would be well, it's probably going to be more if he ends up being a better receiver. I don't. First of all, I don't know if that's true. But just based on this, if if we give him kind of a, a ceiling of almost 600 routes run, like a lot of other number two wide receivers, that puts him right at 75, which means just based on this, his ceiling is 75. And if you look at it, Amari Cooper, who I'm comparing him to, had 78 receptions. And actually the number one guy, Donovan Peoples-Jones, had 61. So only one person had 75 receptions, and it was just 78. I know the Cleveland Browns aren't the greatest, but I don't want to compare it to the Chiefs because, you know, I'm now now we're going to the the high end of the spectrum in terms of passes thrown and all that kind of stuff. But even if you say, well, it's possible that he gets better, so he'll get more receptions per route run, it really just comes down to what, uh, I'm I'm sure there's a, what is the fantasy football term, the the target share. I could actually see his target share go down on a per route basis. So his target share might go up overall because he didn't play a ton. But if you ask the question, when Romeo Dobbs is on the field and runs a route, what percentage of the time does the ball go to him? I could see that going down. Because look at his competition last year. I mean, there was a period of time where Christian Watson really wasn't playing. So he's going up against Lazard. Granted, Aaron Rodgers, who loves Lazard and, and, and these guys. But he, he didn't really have a problem force-feeding Dobbs early on in the season either. So I don't know that I would read too much into that. You had Alan Lazard. You had Randall Cobb. Sammy Watkins. And now I think you're going to have a more established Christian Watson and Samori Ture. And also, you're going to have Musgrave, and you're going to have Kraft, which I think is a significant upgrade as far as receiving options at tight end. So let's just say those things balance themselves out. Better receiving options this year, despite the whatever growth Romeo Dobbs is going to have. If we're saying the ceiling is 76 receptions, it's hard to to say he's going to get 75. And, And, you know, again, last year wasn't the greatest year. The number one guy in Green Bay, as far as receptions, was Lazard. He had 60. So 75 is pretty high. And if you look at it, there's only 31 receivers that had 75 or more. So you're kind of saying number one. Now, you could say, well, that makes sense because Christian will kind of be the most talented guy, but I think the receptions will go to Dobbs. Maybe, man. I mean, if if you want to go that route, all I'm saying is it seems like you're betting on his ceiling, and so I would take the under on it. Although I could easily see him getting more if, you know, if that connection and and pay attention to training camp. Like if you're betting money on it, see if that connection stays true. We heard about it in OTAs, but that's OTAs, right? Let's see what happens when the pads come on and there's a little bit more physicality. Is he able to get away from these guys to the same way that, let's say, Jaden Reed or Luke Musgrave or Christian Watson can? Maybe, you know, Love is going to have to start looking in another direction once this thing gets real. Because if he is that number one option, yes, yeah, 75 I think is attainable. But again, my, my thing is, I feel like we're flirting with the ceiling, so I would go under. Ryan, Kyle from Madison. What's up? Hey, I just wanted to reply to your response to, to my call the other day about, uh, we were talking about the positionalism, Yep. and you brought up you know, whether or not the LaFleur hire in that system being implemented was the right move, and I think it's a fair question. My my opinion on that is I I cannot fault the Packers at all. I think as a thought experiment, you know, if you imagine you're the Packers and you look around the league and you see clearly that this Shanahan system is working, there's several young coaches making it work, and you get an opportunity to hire one of them from that tree, I think any of us, if, if I just said, hey, you know, Aaron Rodgers is going to be on the San Francisco 49ers playing for Kyle Shanahan. I think all of us on paper would go, woof. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be lethal. And I think that's what the Packers were thinking. And so I don't fault their decision making at all, whether it works or, or not. Um, I, I still won't fault them on that. Certainly it worked in patches with Aaron and, and we got very close, but the wild card being, he wants to do at the line of scrimmage. And, like, if you go and look back, I think probably the game that impressed me the most, not from a statistical standpoint, but just from a, like, whoa, Rodgers is tough to beat uh, point of view, is when he played the Cardinals a few years ago. And Adams is out. Um, the Cardinals were playing really well. I think they were, like, 4-1 and one or 5-1 and one at that time. And 
Aaron came into that game, and it was in Arizona, and he stayed in the system. Yeah. He was methodical. He hung in on throws. Um, it was, one, in my opinion, one of his best games the last few years. Also and ran the ball. Watch that film again. I mean, he was, he wasn't playing the hero ball. He wasn't doing the, I need to make this crazy play happen on 100% of plays. It was exactly what you were describing the other day, where eight out of 10 throws, you read the defense, you get the ball out on time, you let your player make a play. Um, and then 20% of the time, you do the Mahomes, Rogers, superhero act if you need to. Um, and so I think there is proof that it totally could have worked. I don't know if it's 100% on Rodgers or what happened there, but there are definitely situations where when, when run the way I believe it was drawn up, uh, it worked to great effect, even sometimes with inferior talent like we did in that game. All right, talk to you later. Yeah, I mean, getting back to, so actually the, yeah, the, the Cardinals were 7-0 and going into that game. Uh, they were this unstoppable force. I mean, they were they were a whole different deal, man. They were supposed to revolutionize the NFL. They they had the fastest defense in the entire world, and that was when the Packers kind of um did this whole thing that we were talking about in terms of if you're going to get smaller and faster, we're going to get bigger and stronger. And I think the Packers might have been the team that exposed that. Um, if I may give them maybe too much credit, because after they lost to the Packers, they ended up eleven and six, which is to say that um. Let's see, they lost one, two, three, four, five, six games in a span of uh, 10 weeks. And then they go into the playoffs and just get obliterated the first week because they wouldn't have even gotten into the playoffs had it not been for that seven-game streak. But yeah, they they didn't win one game back-to-back. They they beat the 49ers the next week, then lost to the Panthers, then beat the Seahawks, then they had a bye week, which I guess... If you don't count that, then it was two in a row. But then it was they beat the Bears, and then they lost to the Rams, lost to the Lions, lost to the Colts, beat the Cowboys, lost to the Seahawks, and then lost to the Rams in the playoffs. But yeah, getting back to the should they have hired Matt LaFleur to begin with, and for those that don't know, if I recall even what I was talking about, um, I just kind of mentioned, you know, could you bring up a case that maybe they shouldn't have hired Matt LaFleur to begin with, you know, looking at, you know, Rodgers maybe didn't really like the system, and, um, you know, if you're going to go all in, then find a scheme that's best for Rodgers rather than, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I, th- I think to your point, there's kind of two parts to it. Number one is I think there was a bigger vision than just Aaron Rodgers at that time. And given how bad things were going and the fact that Rodgers wasn't even necessarily Rodgers the last couple of years, the injuries, the age, um, and just turnover in general, new GM and everything, new new vision, new direction, I think the thing was, if it helps Rodgers, great, but I'm not going to be hamstrung by the quarterbacks um, you know, d- doing what's best for him. We want to go by what the NFL is doing so that you know, if it, if it works for Rodgers, awesome, then we're doing a great job. If it doesn't, then we move on. We find somebody else that, that can execute it. But also, yeah, to your point, there's no reason to believe that we, we did it with the expectation that it was going to hurt Rodgers. Right, I mean the the whole thing is it's quarterback friendly. Rodgers should be great in it. I think the 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 issue was that Rodgers didn't like it, um, which I don't even think Rodgers knew that. I think if you'd have asked him, like, "Hey, Rodgers," for all I know, he he put his input into it because again, he admired this scheme. He thought it was great, and it just seems like once it got here, all of a sudden he's like, "I don't like this anymore." Um, I think he loved the the beauty of the Shanahan system. And I think he really admired, you know, how he was able to get people open and how creative and just how intelligent it is as an intelligent person. I think he admired the intelligence of it all. What I don't think he anticipated or appreciated was as a quarterback, the intelligence is dictated to the coach and you are the mindless drone who sits there and distributes the ball. Obviously that's not really the case. You still have to be extremely intelligent, but for Rogers standards, that's how he felt about it. And he, I don't think he started to really appreciate that aspect of it and was like, no, you know what, I think I know what's best. I get that like I'm supposed to do this out of the other, but I'm also really good at reading defenses. And so when I see something, I'm just going to change it and we're just going to go do that. But yeah, in theory, there should not have been any issue with it. Hey, this is Omar Firefighter. How y'all doing? What's up? I'm calling back. Again, this is the most time I think I've called in the day in a long time. <laughs> um, just, just a little chat and just some things. 
One, I wanted to say congratulations on my man Joe becoming the uh, janitor again. I knew you could do it. Yep. Make janitors, janitors great again. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, my next thing was, don't ask me why I popped in my mind, but I'm, I'm a little behind on the podcast, so you probably already talked about this, but one is, uh, are you going to watch Hard Knocks being that it has the Jets on it and Al Because I sure am. I'm, yep. I, I cannot wait to watch I'm this. I'm stoked. This is going to be interesting. I'm not going to lie. Can- in fact, I'm excited that you brought it up because it's one of those things I keep forgetting. And um, when I really think about it, like, I mean, it's it's really cool because I know as a Packer fan, I'm supposed to say I never want Hard Knocks to come to Green Bay because this is a distraction and then we're going to be bad because of Hard Knocks or whatever. Dude, I look, fine, fine. I don't want it here then. If it's this horrible distraction that makes you terrible, apparently, then fine. I guess I don't want it, but I want it. I want the cameras in the locker room. I want that access. I mean, think about how pissy we get about the fact that we we aren't allowed to view training camp and we can't take pictures and videos like we want that access you don't think i want access on the field during training camp and then after they leave the field go into the locker room i I can't describe to you how badly i want that so the fact that we get that access of rogers even though it's after he left i've been wanting this since forever with the assumption that i'm never gonna see it and now to some degree we're gonna see it and listen, the Rodgers thing, yeah, it's been drama this out of the other, but but I've enjoyed the whole thing. I like the access. I like the fact that it's a little bit behind the curtain. We get a little bit of that, but it's just it's just a fraction in terms of what we've been seeing um, on the Pat McAfee show or whatever. This, this is going to be much more in-depth. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it, and I, it's cool that in a way we're kind of finally getting it, where we get to see Rodgers behind the scenes, it's unfortunate that it's not in a Packers jersey, but I kind of feel like a wish has been fulfilled because I know I'm supposed to say I don't want Hard Knocks to come to Green Bay, but I freaking do. Of course I do. So if I had a second best option, this would be it. It would be the New York Jets, so I get to see Aaron Rodgers, get to see like the behind the scenes of the last freaking however many years, over a decade that he's been the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. And I'm sure people try to make drama out of it in terms of look how much of a D-bag he is or look how nice he is. I thought he was terrible. or Dude, just how about this? Shut up. I just want to watch. I just want to see it. I'm just excited to finally get a little bit of behind the scenes of what it's like to be in the locker room with Rodgers or see how he communicates with guys, you know. I'm just looking forward to it. I like hard knocks in the way I watch it. I didn't watch the Cardinals one because it was in season and they suck, and I was like, I don't really want to watch the team that suck. Right. But maybe they could do the Packers in season. Yeah. So that would be pretty cool to get some extra behind scenes footage. It would be Rodgers in the first and then do Jordan Love in the second. I think that would be awesome. Um, and my last thing is this. It's just, again, another random uh, movie, but I heard you on the podcast where you are talking about paying your dues about like how your son in law, future son in law will have to pay his dues. And it just remind me of the movie, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. And they say, You gotta pay your dues, Jack you know, which <laughs> I'm not sure if, if you've seen that movie, but you're no. you're a little younger than me, but you're on the age where that movie was very popular, became a cult classic. I highly recommend if anybody ever hasn't seen it, John Copper the movie. It's called Big Trouble in Little China. And it's basically the movie where that whoever made Ed Boone, who made Mortal Kombat, yeah. he saw all the characters there and then made them into Mortal Kombat characters. So it's really? it's, it's a good martial arts That's awesome. action, you know, plenty of cheese, but positive cheese, if you know what I mean. So definitely recommend that. And um, if anybody ever seen it, it's an 80s movie, but it's one of those top. You know, 80s movies, by the way. So definitely highly re- recommend you watch that. John Carpenter? And I, I'm going to I'm gonna do something uh, to make sure you can actually watch these movies I recommend. So I, I'm going to look out. I'm going to try to find some stuff for you. And I'm going to make sure you can watch all these movies <laughs> all right. so you don't be left behind. You go, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Or I'm going to go watch it. So I'll look at I'll, I'll send something to you shortly for that. But anyway, all right, go back, go. Well, it looks fantastic. Big Trouble in Little China. John Carpenter directed it. Um, Kurt Russell is in there. Um, some other names that I wouldn't know if I just read it, but seeing their faces, I definitely recognize. Uh, James Hong being one of them. Um, who else was it that I recognized in there? So I recognize a different picture on Google, but now that it's IMDb, I don't recognize them. 
But yeah, that looks fantastic. I got to, uh, let me see here if I can find out how to watch this. It's on Tubi. Freaking Tubi, man. Love Tubi. It's so stupid and amazing. Anyways, man, I appreciate that. Um, it's kind of late. I was just thinking maybe I'll get started on that tonight, but I am so freaking tired. That'll be a tomorrow thing. I'll, I'll, I'll get on that tomorrow sometime. All right, Joe, last call. Take us out of here. Hey, Brian. It's Joe. The janitor. How's it going? How you doing, bud? Good, man. You? Hey, so, um, Good. I was thinking before, you know, we must have been getting close to, uh, a year of the Packers, uh, call-in show. Yeah, man. You know? So, um, I looked back through, and it looks like the first day was, uh, July 12th. Oh, wow. So, July 12th has, uh, come and went, and I wanted to congratulate you on, That's um, crazy. a successful year. Thank of uh, Packer Net After Dark. Um, hopefully, it continues. Um, but uh, I do believe I was one of the first callers, at least in the first couple of weeks, calling as Joe from Connecticut. Um, and I just happened to be a janitor, and I believe, um, no, I know, Brian, you dubbed me Joe the janitor. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Well, I just want to say once again, Congratulations on a year. Show them. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. I, I honestly didn't even think about it. it. As I'm sitting here, I'm like, that's not right. There's no, like, I, I, here's how stupid I am. I'm sitting here going, did we seriously have Packernet after dark during the season last year? I'm, I don't even remember that. <laughs> Must have been crazy. I don't remember. Seems fake. But actually, we are coming up on episode 300 here. What episode is this? This is this is 299. So tomorrow is episode 300 of Packernet After Dark, which is super crazy. We're also coming up on what for the regular show here? Um, tomorrow is 1769. So almost kind of getting close to 1800 for that. So over 2,000 episodes I have recorded as a Packers podcaster. Freaking crazy, man. 2,000. 2,000 times. What is going on here? Anyways, you guys have a good night. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.